For this lesson we're going to be looking at operations that you can perform when you have multiple functions. And in particular we're going to be looking at fairly simple operations. I'm only focusing on addition, subtraction, and multiplication. So the idea is taking two or more, we're going to focus on two, so two separate functions and we're going to add, subtract, or multiply them together to create a new function. Now when you are considering doing such a thing the big thing you need to keep in mind is the domain. If you have two functions that have the same domain, and the easiest domain that I can think of, for example, if you have two functions who both have the domain x member of r, meaning they are, their domain is all real numbers, no problem. You just go ahead and combine them algebraically. You have to keep the domain in mind because sometimes you'll have restrictions on one or both of the original domains. And if there are restrictions on the domains, then your new function, you just go ahead and do the algebra the way you would normally. But you do have to state the domain of the new function, and that new domain is actually going to have the restrictions from both of the original functions. Um, that will mean that the new domain is going to be the smaller of both of the original because it's going to have both of those sets of restrictions on it. And I think the easiest way for me to illustrate something like this very quickly would be imagine one of our domains is if we did it on a number line it's all of the numbers let's say from 3 onward and then another one of our domains was from 5 downward, but it didn't include 5. So this is an example of x greater than or equal to 3. This one is an example of x less than 5. So what is our new domain going to look like? Our new domain is actually going to start here with the 3. I haven't left myself a lot of room. Let me put it in between here. It's going to start here with the 3, and it's going to go up here to the 5, which will be an open circle and it will just be what's in between them. Okay, so we will have lost everything above here and we will have lost everything below here and so the new domain as you can see there is going to be 3 less than or equal to x less than 5. It's the combination of those two restrictions is going to result in this overall restriction. So that's something you're going to need to keep in mind when the domains are not something simple and the domains are not identical. If you're doing this from a graph, you might not actually always be doing this algebraically. If you're doing this from a graph or from a set of points, then all you're going to do is you're going to align the x values together and then perform what the operation is on the y values. So if you're adding, for example, if you are adding two functions together, you would choose an x value, x equals 0. You would find the points or the corresponding y values, and then you would add those y values together. We never combine the x values. The x values are the independent variable. That's just the reference. It's the y values. Those are the values of the function. If you have an equation, if you have an algebraic representation, you're just going to do the algebra, keeping in mind your restrictions from the domains. Now I've got a very simple example here to start off. Let's say we have the function f of x is equal to the square root of x minus 3 and the function g of x is equal to 1 over x minus 5. Uh, I'm gonna, you could probably do some of these things in your head if you're feeling fresh and you're remembering how these functions work but just a quick reminder this is the radical function the parent function is square root of x x minus 3 means this has been shifted to the right by 3. So the graph of this is going to be shifted to the right by 3 and it's going to look something like that. This one, 1 over x minus 5, this is the reciprocal function, 1 over x, except for this one has been shifted to the right by 5. So I put another couple of pieces on my scale there. There's 3, there's 5. The rational function is going to have an asymptote at 
x equals 5. Normally it has an asymptote at x equals 0, but this one's been shifted to the right by 5. And it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And then the rational function is going to look something like this and like this, approaching those two asymptotes. Now if we take a look at this, where are these domains overlapping? So visually, you can see that the radical only goes here to 3. There's nothing to the left of 3, which means we're going to lose all of this. And the other big thing to keep in mind is that the reciprocal function has an asymptote at 5, which means we're going to lose x equals 5. Now that's from the graph, and the graph is helpful for helping us visualize this, but what if we looked at this in terms of the domain? The domain of f would normally, for the parent function, it would be x greater than or equal to 0, but in this case it's been shifted to the right by 3, and so that would be x member of r such that x is greater than or equal to 3. The domain of g is going to be x member of r such that x is not equal to 5. So let's now take a look at our new function and for the sake of labeling I'm just actually going to call this one h of x is equal to f of x plus g of x which is equal to the square root of x minus 3 plus 1 over x minus 5. Now I could perform an algebraic simplification here but there's really no great need to do that. I'm not going to end up with an expression that's that's particularly uh, nicer or easier to interpret or anything along those lines and that is not really the purpose of what I'm doing here right now. What I really want to focus on now is what is the domain of h. Now we can still use real numbers but our restrictions are the combination of both of these put together. So this one's actually still quite straightforward because we are quite literally just saying x is greater than or equal to 3 comma x not equal to 5. Now there might be a better way to express that simply because the idea of having generally and I'm not sure if this is a, a very hard or fast rule here, but generally you want your restrictions to either be an assertion or a negation. An assertion is where you say, is where you assert what you can have, whereas a negation here, a restriction, you're saying what you cannot have. So I actually think I would prefer in this case for my domain of H, I think I would probably prefer to see something more like this. I'll have to do some more thought about this one, which is the lowest value is 3. So it's 3 less than or equal to x up to, but not including 5. And then I skip over 5, and then I say x greater than 5. And you know what? I'm kind of torn between those two. I'll have to do a little bit more research on that. I think both are mathematically valid. I'll just have to do some checking into which the... Um, which of those is a more, if there is one or the other, that's a more acceptable convention. But both of those domains accurately describe the restriction on this new combined function. Okay, for our next examples, I'm just reminding you, we've talked about even and odd already as a part of this unit, I'm just reminding you of the definitions. Even has this, basically this single definition. This is really the only way to define even. Odd has two definitions, both of which are valid. It's up to you to decide which one you want to make use of. So keeping those in mind, I'm, I'm setting this other example, which is I'm trying to do some additional combinations here. You can see I'm using addition, subtraction, multiplication. I even have a multiplying by a constant. And I want to determine for these different combinations of functions, is the result, I want to know what is the symmetry. So if f of x and g of x are even functions, is this going to produce an even function, an odd function, or not neither? 
even, odd, or neither. So that's what we're trying to determine. Are we, we're trying to find out is something either even, odd, or neither. And you can see going further, I ask you to repeat this entire set for two odd functions and then repeat it again for one even and one odd. And I even ask the question, does it matter if we do an even first and then an odd or an odd first and then an even? So there's a lot more here than I'm going to cover in the context of this lesson. I'm just going to do one of these to get you started. And I think I'm actually going to choose one that's a little bit less than trivial. Um, so I'm not going to start with A. I think I will start with B, which is another addition. Um, you know what, we did an addition in the previous example. Let's, let's do C. Let's do the subtraction. So I'm going to need a fresh page to do this, I think. So we've got H of X is equal to F of X minus G of X. And I've started off with both of these being even. So we're actually going to make use of the definition of even, which is that we know that f of x is the same as f of negative x. That's the definition of even. And we know that g of x is equal to g of negative x. And so the question is, we want to know is h of x equal to h of negative x? That's our question because we want to know whether or not this is even. And so the way that you do this is a left side, right side. So let's start with the left side. The left side is h of x, which is as defined here, that's f of x minus g of x. The right side is equal to h of negative x, which is equal to f of negative x minus g of negative x. It's just the same function definition we've used in the past. Wherever I see an x, I'm going to replace it with my new argument, which is negative x. But now that I've done that, I can start to incorporate these definitions because I have an f of negative x here but I also have an f of negative x here and it turns out that f of negative x is actually the same as f of x minus g of negative x which is what I have right here is the same as g of x so I can replace that with g of x and without too much trouble, you can see that I have actually shown that left side is equal to right side, f of x minus g of x, f of x minus g of x. Therefore, h of x, which is f of x minus g of x, is even. And you might say, well, what does that mean? The larger meaning of that is because I didn't have these two functions, f of x and g of x, I didn't define them in any particular way. I just used the very generic definitions for them. That means that I have essentially proven that if you take the difference, if you subtract two even functions, the result is also, also going to be even. Remember that even means you have this uh, reflective symmetry in the y-axis. So if this one is symmetric in the y-axis and if this one is symmetric in the y-axis, when you subtract the two of them, you're going to end up with something that is also symmetric in the y-axis. And that's actually an interesting result. And I'm going to leave it as an exercise to work through some of these other ones as well and then repeat this for odd. And then exercise four is really... I don't want to see people necessarily brute forcing this. You can do that. You can just repeat this if you want to and go through all of them. But put some thought into it first. Give some thought into what that might mean and whether or not from what you've done when you've done the work for exercise two and exercise three, you should have a pretty, a pretty good idea of how to um, get an answer for exercise four. You're still going to have to do the work to find out whether you get even and odd, but whether or not order matters, that's something you should be able to think your way through based on the work you've done before. 
Okay, and I believe that is it for this lesson.